Welcome to Whole Back Rack Podcast. My name is Jessica Hare. I operate Hare Hollow Farm and we breed boas, balls, and select colubrids. Hi, I'm Jenna King. I operate ASM Royal Tails and I breed high end ball pythons. We want to share our journey navigating herpetoculture and are dedicated to promoting biohazard safety for all species. And we would love you to answer the question what's in your whole back rack? Welcome to episode 25. This is our quarter life crisis. We're doing quarter it. Quarter life crisis. <laughs> oh, if it starts hailing, it's going to be really loud. FYI, guys. It's yeah. been like hailing off and on here. Here too. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, that's part of the ambiance. I have this one titled as like a, a bait and switch. Mm-hmm. I see that. Because I, saw I know that. exactly I... why everyone clicked on this one. Because we're going to talk about the number one secret to successful boa breeding. Everyone's like, boa breeding's so hard. They don't go. They don't ovulate. They slug out. They die. Well, I'm going to tell you the number one reason why that happens. It's not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I tricked you into listening to this yeah. stupid podcast. But to me, it is the number one reason. Number two would be overfeeding. Because if they're obese, they just fucking roll all the time anyway. But number one is the best reason. It's an, And it's a secret because, oh, we'll get into it. All right. Post last week's podcast, were you depressed? Was I depressed? Yeah. No, I thought it was really interesting and like completely different than anything we've done. And he's very knowledgeable about what he's doing and marketing and selling. And I enjoyed it very much. I didn't have a whole lot to contribute, which it's an interview, so I don't necessarily need to contribute, but I enjoyed it very much. You didn't have any like a uh, crisis of confidence about oh that we reptile breeding, it. yeah, I mean, he makes you feel like you're in the wrong hobby, but I mean, I've had a little bit of crisis of faith, I mean that's normal in the reptile hobby. I feel like you have bouts during the year of crisis of faith, and like right about now is like when you have one of those bouts anyway because you're waiting on eggs and everybody else has eggs or they have babies popping out and you're just like oh my whole thing is gonna suck and you just have doubts and reservations or it's like really slow on morph markets so you're like i'm gonna have a thousand babies and none of them are gonna sell and you know i mean he had some pretty valid conclusions about how the it just you you always hear like all the people at the top of the pyramid that are like you're going to make so much money. You're going to make so much money. You're going to make so much money. And it's nice to hear someone who's not at the top of the pyramid just giving it to you straight from what they experience. And I feel like he had a successful online store and other things. And he's quite knowledgeable about online sales and marketing. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a little disheartening that maybe I'm doing the wrong thing to to make it out there in the great big world. Well, ostensibly, he, even though he chose to not do it anymore he was successful the whole time and still chose not to do it anymore touts that you shouldn't do it if you want to make a lot of money right even though he was successful right obviously you can make money but it's just not the easiest money dollar you could make so how right. long does passion carry you forward like the the two best examples of like somebody's exit interview from the hobby are yeah, Sean Bradley, Exotic by Nature, on Ball Shit, he talks about why he's getting out of ball pythons as he's, like, doing his podcast. And then Chris Eaton, Snakes and the Fat Man, also basically explains why he's getting out in, like, the old Snakes and the Fat Man episodes as he's getting out. And then he stops making episodes for two years and he comes back randomly. But both of those are, like, high-profile people that left, but, like, countless others have left also. So I actually like exit interviews because they they could potentially inform someone who's getting in or in the middle how they could steer their ship differently. Differently, Yeah. And I think a lot of people get sucked into like, I need this to be a full time income. And that I think might put too much pressure on the passion part of it. Like maybe it'd be better if it was just a part time income and it never had to be super high pressure sales or whatever. And, it, and so maybe more people should choose that instead of... There's a reason it's called hobby breeding. Yeah, and uh, as we get into it here later, not very many full-timers are actually people you should be envious of 
some of them do a good job with their animals, but a lot of them have to cut corners, which Joe was talking about professionally to make the dollars and cents make sense for them. And I think you can still do it correctly, but maybe the market does not support that doing it correctly every time. It's hard to know. Yeah, I don't know. That's I'm trying all. real hard not to think about it. <laughs> I was, uh, to be honest, I was a little bit depressed, but in like a confused way. Because I was just like, is this a mistake doing a podcast in general? I still don't actually know. Yeah, you seem disheartened in the podcast, like online presence type of way, rather than in breeding your snakes. Right, because I could probably continue to breed snakes indefinitely with no exposure and just have fun breeding snakes because i always liked that your passion will carry you is what you're saying right that part of it but i already know right now i'm already tired of selling snakes if i never had to sell another snake for the rest of my life that'd be great so well how am i going to feel about it in three years or four years and then if the only way to move snakes is to have like a wider and wider funnel that exposes you to more and more people that don't necessarily agree with you and don't necessarily like you yeah. just to move a couple $150 corn snakes. Is that worth it? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know either. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm getting out today. I really want to find like the gotta have it guys, gotta have it reptiles. Like they had the best gene in ball pythons and they still got out. Or any of the other people who were like quite popular at one time. Why did they get out? Is it always just the burden of selling being like so irritating? Or a lot of times it's like family stuff, like they have to move or they have a kid or a divorce drives people out of the hobby. Or change in circumstances. Yeah, what job situation, they go to school, they go back to school. So those are like understandable. But why does someone get so demoralized with the process that they once loved that they choose that route? So we need to find something like that. So if you know anybody, let me know. Or if you're listening and that's you, (laughs) message us. If you're getting out now, right, as we speak. (laughs) (laughs) That's all. I enjoyed the Joe interview. It was interesting. I just... It was a lot to chew on. Yeah. I thought about it for a long time. I don't know what I still think about it. I had a lot going on. So I thought about it while we were, like, interviewing him. (laughs) And then didn't think about it again. Then I haven't thought about it since. But it was a big week for my family, so... (laughs) You'll have to excuse my lack of pondering my existence in the reptile hobby. That's okay. I did enough for all of us. The primary topic here is because of the Bob Clark fiasco, which has been going on now for like three weeks. He sold a boa, uh, like a motley combo of some kind, to a person. It came... And the person did not like the look of it and apparently had mites and whatever. It was there for three weeks and then it died. And she took the body for a necropsy and it was confirmed to have a renovirus. And then, and this was like some weeks ago. And so she's been posting the necropsy for the last three weeks on different Facebook groups. Have you seen any of those? Mm -mm. Okay. There was one today where Bob Clark was defending himself on like with the FBI group. And it's actually hilarious so if you want a good time i don't know if they've taken it down yet are those the screenshots that you sent me no this is a fresh Fresh. 400 commented (laughs) he's trying to defend himself like he thinks the animal went downhill because it was put into quarantine in something where the cool side was 75 degrees even though it's still at a hot spot and that's why it died (laughs) listen it's good I won't go- rehash the whole thing. The point is, the animal had an arena virus infection. Some of it, it's pertinent information. <laughs> he apparently offered her a refund, but only if she was quiet about it. And so she didn't like that. So she refused the refund because she didn't want to be like kept quiet because about it. Because it was like, hush, hush, shady, shady. Right. So that's where that is. I don't feel like that's terribly abnormal, although most people are respectful. You don't have to ask them to be like, don't blast me on the social media. Right. But I think she may or may not have been like pissed him off first with her tone or something. And then he was like, I'll refund you, but you need to keep it on the DL. And she's like, 
you sent me something that was complete dog shit. You don't get the opportunity to refund me. I'm going to go ahead and put you on blast because of the whatever. I don't, there's not a, there right. is not a full accounting of every message to each other. They're just like pieces of messages back and forth that have been screenshotted. It was something like that. Something went sour in like the negotiation post whatever. Okay. So there's that. And that's happened like four or five weeks ago now. But it's been going on and on and on in, in more posts. And then the post today where Bob Clark was trying to defend himself with the information this, that her it, cool side was 75 degrees was somehow damning, which it really isn't for right. a boa. <laughs> no, it's not. Even a little bit. Especially if they had a hot spot. So is this a boa that he flipped? A boa that he's had in his collection? A boa that he hatched? I mean, what... He what won't. Age was the boa? He didn't want to divulge that information publicly or privately. <laughs> he also didn't divulge like if he's tested the rest of his collection or you know like anything that would like corroborate because he believes that she infected it with arena virus in the three weeks that she had it. Right in, in quarantine. Yes. Is it have a that fast of a turnaround? No. Okay. And you don't like get zero percent body fat and you know advanced symptoms you might i don't know when how quickly you can get a positive once infected maybe like i would be guessing or something yeah maybe maybe not even that but like a really good strong positive that like blows it up and has lots of tissue degradation because they show the the necropsy so it came it with arena virus yeah, yes yeah and it had it for a long while since it was born probably oh um, man so, th- so that's like the start of this. John Lehman, the owner of Morph Market, commented that he was investigating. Ryan McVeigh, the owner of VivTech, sort of put Bob Clark on blast too. So everybody who is popular is now like chimed in somewhere on this issue. He's a big, big deal, Bob Clark, right? I mean, he's like one of those like legacy like he's a dudes. Known, yeah, right. For years, but he's also well known to have sent people terrible things for years oh Oh, okay dying things dying things that's no good of all kinds retics there's a bunch of like fbi things of like dead dying balls boas retics coming out of his collection people have obviously gotten okay stuff from him too but if you're flipping a certain percent what percent are okay versus not okay versus what he breeds in house nobody knows nobody knows so this isn't really about Bob Clark. This is about arena virus. So I've seen, as always, more confusion about what arena virus is than ever before <laughs> in the like discussions of this issue. I've seen people confuse it with nidovirus. They're like, I can't believe he would send a boa with nidovirus. Like they've already confused <laughs> it right in the first message. Right. And you're right. like, those are two different things. Sorry, bud. Or just general people think arena virus doesn't exist. So there was another girl who just joined the Discord. What's up? And her seller said arena virus hadn't existed since the 90s. Was like, oh, it magically disappeared. <laughs> I know. Cool. Isn't that weird? And so that was his defense about why the the ball python that she received. In the 90s. Right. Well, it just disappeared. Oh, uh, right oh, after okay. that. Just in so case we invented she... tests to find this thing that no longer existed? Right. Cool. Yes. And then we had a ball python with arena virus come in from another breeder who died within three weeks of, or two or three weeks of, of receipt. And she didn't say who it was who sent her that ball python, but she, it was a big breeder and she believed based on the fact that it was a big breeder that it was clean and she put it in a rack with other snakes, other <gasps> ball pythons. Oh. So I had to hold her hand through like, it's okay that you trusted someone, but you got burned. Hopefully he'll okay. refund you and you need to go test the piss out of everybody. Yep. So this is like f- three or four arena virus things is in like one two week span since the Joe interview. I'm like, we got to just go ahead and do it because <laughs> we're, we're up to our eyeballs on arena eyeballs. virus yeah, talk. for sure. And then our next guest, whenever she comes on, has had lots of arena virus experience. So that's why we're talking about it today. A then- little preparatory episode. <laughs> And it is, in my opinion, the number one secret for successful boa breeding because there's nothing that makes something breed less well than dying. Than dead. Yep. And killing all other things and their babies. Right. Just so dead. 
100% a good feature of a boa breeding program is not full of infectious diseases. Yep. <laughs> I agree. Uh, okay. Do you want to read number one? Arena virus, or now Repta arena virus, mm-hmm. Repti arena virus, is an envelope virus that is strongly implicated as the causative agent of the condition known as IBD or BIBD. Right. So IBD stands for inclusion body disease and BIBD stands for Bowen inclusion body disease. You'll see both words used interchangeably in the literature. So- I see IBD said more. It's like NIDO and Serpentovirus. Like I see people use IBD rather than arena in their terminology when they're talking about it. And I think we should stop doing that today. Okay. Because like arena or is the is like the causative agent. IBD is the disease that results from it. So when people are like, my snake has IBD, um, the first thing is like, did you actually test it for anything? What are you, are you just seeing symptoms? And based on the symptomology, you're just assuming you know the causative agent of it? Because neurological symptoms can be caused by a lot of stuff. So I prefer we go to not calling it IBD anymore. Instead, calling it arena virus infected snakes. Because you can be infected with arena virus and not yet have developed IBD. Okay. So it's like AIDS and HIV. 100%. So you can definitely be HIV positive, but you're so well controlled. You don't actually have full-blown AIDS yet, and you're probably doing okay. But it's still worth knowing that you're positive, so you don't transfer it to your boyfriend and or girlfriend. Originally, before we knew what the cause was, we diagnosed it by looking for inclusion bodies, which is what's in the name. And those are just little clumps of misfolded proteins that form in tissues that are being attacked by the virus. So they look like little dark circles in the like partially decayed tissue. So that's all where the name comes from. People used to, Elijah talked about this, like take blood samples and smear them out to look for white blood cells that had inclusions in them, like little misformed protein pockets. And they're like, oh look, maybe this one is full of the mystery disease before we knew what caused it. It's not a good way to to decide if they're infected with arena virus because other things can cause inclusion bodies and an arena virus infected animal might not yet be so far gone that it has inclusion bodies. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you ever do smears or things like that with your collection, your previous collection? Yes. So when I took some stuff to Dr. Scott Stahl to like euthanize and check, he could not find inclusions in animals that were upside down and could not put themselves right side up. So it's an okay metric for what it is, but it's not the only one. It's not okay. the only symptom that we should be looking for. And it's it's better to go back to like, what's a virus that in the right circumstances will cause disease? That's what we need to be looking for. Because they're not going to have disease if they don't have the virus. Just like NIDA. Same thing, different virus. Inclusions are most often found in the brain, lungs, and liver, and blood. But they can be found almost anywhere. There have been inclusions found in eyeballs and digestive tract lining. So that means the virus is sort of like NIDO, where it has a spot that it wants to be, but it can just get frisky, wander off, and start infecting other cell types. I don't know if like the ones that are like surface are from mite attacks. Like when mites bite, they're transferring the virus and they're just, like getting into the eye because the mites like chewing at this corner of right. the eyes. I don't know. Nobody knows why. Different tissues will show it more than other ones. But it seems to like to run through the nervous system the best and get in the liver. So they used to do like live liver samples from snakes to check for, like that would be like one of the better places to check but it wouldn't kill the snake because you can't really check their brain because that would kill them. <laughs> yeah. No, you can't do like brain core samples. Yeah, no, that would be bad. Classic IBD is neurological symptoms. So stargazing, failure to write, pupils that don't dilate or contract correctly. And then general poor motor control, like the back third or back 60% of the snake just stops moving and the front sort of still works. That can happen. There's other symptoms that uh, get sort of lumped together. Regurgitation, emaciation, anorexia, impaction, and then secondary infections like RI and mouth rot. And some people are like, you're just lumping everything that could ever happen wrong with a snake and like giving it to that disease. 
And like, maybe. But when you're halfway dying of something else, everything else likes to tag team at the same time. Right. Absolutely. So it's the same way with Nido, where you could have a snake who ostensibly has an infection in its lungs, but it gets mouth rot from the bacteria being like, let's go. This is going to be fun. So treatment for the mouth rot with antibiotics will fix that part, but it doesn't fix the chronic lung infection from the virus. Same thing. Arena does the same thing. It sucks. Do you have any questions about what is arena virus? I do not. Excellent. I guess read number three. Arena virus is endemic to the boa genus. And the reason why we know this is because there's a paper out of Brazil that has found arena virus in wild boas. So boa constrictor. We don't know if it's endemic everywhere within boa sigma or boa imperator or boa constrictor, but it is endemic, at least in Brazil. It can spill over into any boid or pythonid that we know of. Most people are aware of that, right? Do you think most people are aware of that? That it's endemic? No, that it can get into any boa or python species. Oh, no, I don't think people know much. (laughs) (laughs) I don't mean that in a mean way. I just mean like I don't think people understand that boa diseases are transferable to pythons and python diseases are transferable to boas all right i think people don't think about it that way but i think people are scared of boas because they think all their pythons are just gonna like drop like canaries yeah which they kind of will and we'll get into that in a second but then you know the train goes both ways so neither viruses that are native to pythons can get into boas and make them roll and vice versa Right. Um, but as far as we know, arena virus has been found in in mixed species collections, basically all the kind of pythons that we keep. We'll talk about how good they or don't do when they're full of arena virus. But if you have a boa and a python of any species, you should assume arena virus could be a potential pathogen for any boa or python species. I guess that's my point. You want to do number six? Uh, boas can tolerate their infections well. Like, they can have it from birth and survive a very long time. An incredibly long time. Maybe even their whole life. Which you're going to be like, Jessica, why would we test for it? If they can go their whole natural life and not die. Because they can introduce it to somebody who hasn't had it their whole natural life and will immediately roll. Or they can introduce it to your other species and they'll immediately roll. It's just... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so there's that. that one still (laughs) did He was fine. <laughs> Great, but all every <laughs> That's exactly it. So it's just like Nidovirus. So one or two out of that species, like or maybe like twenty percent, might go on forever. Cool. But then what about all of the rest? Or what about them when they get shipped funny and they're held over one extra day in Indy because it's fucking Indy? Is that what's gonna take to trigger you know, more symptoms or the virus winning finally. I don't know. Nobody really knows what officially makes a snake that seems pretty good, but is infected with arena virus to go to like full neuro symptoms and falling apart at the seams. There's lots of things that are implicated, like co-infection with other viruses, stress due to breeding or shipping or moving or transporting or some other infection like bacterial sort of starting up first and then the virus is like okay and then it just sort of compounds from there and single variants all by themselves can cause ibd but it looks like it's when you have like a couple piled in there that it's really takes its toll so even if it's kind of okay with just one variant in it you would still want to know that that one's positive for all the reasons we already mentioned and because any sort of doubling of variants that get into the same snake automatically cause disease state it's a mess as always. All right, you want to read number eight? Pythons infected can die quickly, but we have evidence in the literature that some pythons can persist for months and years with active infections and not die or show any symptoms. Years. Years. So yes, if you get a ball python that's full of arena and it goes through your ball python collection, probably 99% of them will die right away. It's like takes like 10 weeks or something for them to show symptoms and then very quickly need to be euthanized. But some of them do okay for longer. So that's why you, even though arena isn't endemic in 
ball pythons. You don't want to accidentally introduce a ball python that's infected with a marina virus into your ball python collection because it came from like a mixed species collection or off of a vendor table that was full of all kinds of bullshit. It's important to know if he was infected and he's just doing good before you spread it all around because the other ball pythons aren't going to do very good if he's just a lucky dude. Um, we know a couple people now who've had bad ball python things happen with arena virus just recently. Yeah, whole collections like a hundred plus snakes just roll. And it's not their fault, you know. If it's one of the ball pythons that does good, it can live longer than three months with the arena virus not showing symptoms yet. So you could get through a normal quarantine and move it in and then share feeders or whatever. Start breeding. Share feeders, yeah, for sure. Or and, use a single tub to clean and... Yeah, it can definitely move on surfaces. Don't let anybody tell you any different. I've also heard people, public figures, who are supposedly experts on infectious diseases and are pretending that, saying that nobody looks for a renovirus or thinks about a renovirus in Python, so, like, it must not be that big of a deal because nobody talks about it. I'm like, who are you listening to? That no, You haven't heard anybody talking about it. Because so I've heard about the guy who's... All of a snake side, he's talking about it. So there's a lot of mixed messagings on arena virus in pythons. And I don't think it's, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. We should be worried about all of them. Definitely Nido because it's endemic to the pythons. But you should definitely be worried about arena too. What do I know? One of the earliest papers says a green tree python may have cleared the virus. But that is the only time anyone has ever implied that any boa or python has cleared the virus. So that may or may not be real. And then colubrids may or may not clear it, but also may or may not be able to be infected. I know they've detected it in a colubrid, but then it didn't do anything, and then it wasn't detectable again. Interesting. So I would assume that colubrids are okay, but I don't know that for a fact, and you shouldn't listen to me. But I do not test my colubrids for arena virus. Well, that's good to know. Is that a mistake? I don't know. But right now, it doesn't look like it's a problem, even if they are infected. They just get over it. That's really cool. That always makes, like, that fascinates me when some species are able to just be like, that was nothing. What else you got? <laughs> <laughs> and, and other species are like, I'm dead. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and supposedly the same is true for cold boas. So rosy boas and rubber boas aren't faced by arena virus also. I wouldn't try this out. This is an anecdotal rumor. That they can be exposed and will never get it. That's really cool. So I don't know. Maybe it'd be interesting to see if like cold pythons. Is there a python that's really cold? Maybe diamond pythons also would not get it. There's usually like a, you know, a temperature. The virus wants to operate most ideally at a particular temperature. So an animal that keeps its body maybe in the 70s all the time would not be a good host for the virus. And so that's why... It doesn't want cold-bodied hosts, colder-bodied hosts. Cool. That's really cool. Uh, Arena virus is best managed with active testing programs and culling or isolating infected snakes because there is no cure and there's little evidence that the vast majority of voids can clear the virus and there's no vaccine. 100%. So it's just like NIDO. You can't do anything to manage it except prevent it from infecting things to begin with. Yeah, good biosecurity, good testing protocols, and a lot of crossing your fingers and hoping. <laughs> yeah. There are people, NIDO people, who are, you know, so sort of towing the line that w maybe we shouldn't call any NIDO positives because unless they're really actively sick or they've caused another animal to be actively sick because we don't know if there are enough nidos that are not disease causing yet or maybe if there are some or whatever and we have the same sort of set of people in the boa department but they're like it's fine it's part of the natural <laughs> flora and fauna yeah it's the exact same people of the species. they're like we yeah. should only okay. call them if somebody already died or they're showing symptoms Otherwise, it doesn't matter that they all die at six because that's natural or whatever. Like there's a lot of <laughs> hand waving and like 
Well, it's all fine. It's all fine. My my investment's all fine. We'll just let these like, diseases exist. It's my, okay if I send you one that's going to die in three weeks. We're all fine. Right. Nothing I, to see here, Jessica. Nothing to see here. I mean, I, I get it. Like, sometimes, like, your, your animal might be six years old and has been tested three times negative and only now is popping positive when you go to breed it because that was, like, enough trigger... They usually didn't test it three times, let me be honest. But that has happened. Only then would it have been enough of right. a trigger to be like, it's positive. Then you're like, well, was it really sick until it was sick? And the answer is yes. Like, we have this problem in cows. It's called Yone's disease. They can live a long time and not pop positive, And it's just chilling in there. But once they do are... And they can have babies while they're testing negative that are also negative. And they're actually negative. But once that cow hits five or six and it's kind of older and shittier, now it's positive and it will infect its babies. Interesting. So we have a good allegory from other animal science. So if that happens to your boa as you're going along, it sucks. But that's the time to be like, okay, this isn't a breeding boa anymore. Now it's either a single snake pet home or a cull boa. But the boa babies, is that the next one? Oh, yeah. It is. So there's vertical transmission in arenavirus. So that means parents to offspring, there's no uterus, but in while she's gravid, can give her offspring either her arenavirus or the male. So sometimes they can skip the mom and just in the semen infect the babies somehow right away. So there are babies that are born <laughs> with the dad's arenavirus, but not the mom's or both or just the mom's. Or just a percentage of the moms. Like if mom is infected with three variants, the babies might have two from mom and one from dad. And you're like, great. Or none. They can also be born with none. How did that happen? It's much harder to deal with arenavirus than it is to deal with, with NIDO because you there's no, oh, we can keep a positive colony and get clean babies out of it if we just incubate them somewhere else. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. But we do have examples where moms have had predominantly negative babies. And it's probably because she has a well-controlled viral load or whatever. Maybe she's only positive in the winter when she's feeling down. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But it's possible. It just isn't likely. Because if she's sort of raging and dying, the virus can cross the barrier between the mother's blood and the baby's little eggs in the oviduct. And it's game over. I had a mom who was infected while gravid. So maybe she was infected for eight weeks, six weeks, something like that. And then she died after giving birth, like two or three weeks later. Her babies were positive within five weeks. So I didn't test them at birth. I was just like double checking. So I don't know if they were infected because they were born in the same environment she was in or they were born infected, but she died really quickly. And then other animals that weren't gravid when they were infected were fine looking when I euthanized them because it's the stress of doing something important like breeding that makes them go downhill usually. Arena virus is just as susceptible to cleaning agents as other envelope viruses like nidovirus. So that's steam, heat, UV, F10, bleach, ammonia, etc. All can deactivate the virus. Yeah, so that part's good. But not not chlorhexidine. Not chlorhexidine. And not soap and water like Nido. No, yes, soap and water. Yes, soap and water? I just didn't put it on there. Oh, okay. It's envelope, so it's a lipid bilayer. So soap would break the lipid open, potentially. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's exactly like Nido in terms of its tolerance for time, like outside of the host. And okay. it's a little dry in here. And if it's on the surface and it's a little bit too dry, like most of them will die because they need to be in a, in a cell to be doing well. So you don't have to do anything extra. Correct. Right. So they're not things. crypto. They are not crypto. Oh, sis. They are just as susceptible as Nido. And I think we go over a lot more in the Nido episode. So we reference do. We talk that. We for a good while. Yeah. We're not going to go over here because I'm sleepy for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Testing is by PCR, by oral swab, blood, or a tissue sample. They've actually detected the DNA also in poop, but that's probably just like swallowed DNA. There's a lot of people who like to complain, as usual, that it's not efficacious or 
you know, sometimes just like with NIDA, it will fail to produce a positive when the animal is positive because there's not enough sample on the swab or the snake is controlling its infection well. It's even worse in arena virus because it seems like boas do an even better job. Controlling it. Yes, because they're more adapted to their endemic virus. There's some evidence of seasonal positives where they're like only positive in the winter and they get better in the summer. It's not in the literature. That's anecdotal. A good testing protocol is test on intake and test when any there's any unusual symptoms and then test before pairing and then test the mothers after they're born. If the mother has been negative the whole time, she could not have given it to her babies. So her babies do not need to be tested individually. But testing her after such a stressful event as giving birth can be more indicative of the real answer. Like I right. said, she's negative after birth. It's very likely that she's going to continue to stay negative. But if you're going to see it in a healthy animal, that would be when you would see it is after she gave birth. Right. It's I guess it's possible even if her post-birth one was positive, she might still have negative babies because it was only like the effect of the birth hormones that like made her pop positive like a week later or something. So right. Usually so test made her like susceptible to the exactly. virus invading her cells. So I've so definitely the babies are already out of there and safe. Right. So that's possible. So you don't necessarily have to be like, oh, I assume all my babies are... I would definitely like double check if a mom pops positive after birth, but they don't necessarily have to be positive. I've heard about it happening just like that. Like everybody's been negative all along. Mom gives birth, babies are negative. Mom pops positive. Boas are hard. They suck. (laughs) But now you know you can't... You can either choose... To only breed the mom when she's testing negative regularly or you're just going to have to rehome her as a pet or call her at that point. I know quite a few people who buy rats for me that buy rats for boas that are just long-term arena positives. And they seem to do a little bit better than ball python, so maybe that's a good option. What is TLDR? Too long, didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You can read that if you want. No one should be buying boas from people who wholesale them. There is a lot of anecdotal Boom. evidence. The positive rate is much higher because of cross-contamination, contact mites, bad practices, blah, 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 a myriad. You shouldn't really buy wholesaler animals if you're going to be breeding anyway. Indeed. I think people don't know that, though. They don't they just, like, see a... They think they're getting a deal. Yeah, a Ben Siegel reptile auction. They're like... Sure, that's going to be great. My discounted, auctioned, sure, it's going to be great. <laughs> There's a- Fed once a month. <laughs> Definitely not going to have it. <laughs> it's going to come awesome. And this is true for probably any animal. If you're going to buy something from a wholesaler and they're not, like, I'm going to exclude people that, like, are select importers of select wild-caught animals. So, like, I'm only bringing in rare colubrids and scrub pythons or something and i'm gonna worm them and test them and then get them ship shape that's a different kind of wholesaler than the people who just bring in just swills of whatever and just barely feed them and literally they're in these like tiny show jars or show tupperwares in giant rubber maids together yes and i heard the other day doesn't even feed their corns they just don't feed them if they live that's great but it costs more labor to just give them all a pinky so they just don't feed them <laughs> the baby corns to get wholesale to them yeah they just don't feed any of them it's too much work or kings or the little colubrids where it's like too much labor whoever makes it to the end or gets bought first i was like that's a crazy story is that slander i don't know this is a reported fact i don't know if it's true but it makes sense to me Whoa. based on the number Whoa there <laughs> Based on the number of half-dead animals they've thrown away in the uh, Pac Noir show and the trash, some of them were still alive, too. Oh, my gosh. They're on the board for U.S. Ark, by the way, in case you're wondering. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> uh, oh, we're not making any friends. That's okay. I've seen, like, some YouTube videos of people going to reptile. They don't call them wholesalers. They like, like, big retail reptile places. And that's what I said. Like, there's, like, shelf upon shelf of Rubbermaids full of the tiny show bins full of yeah. so many reptiles. There were some interesting pictures shared in the Discord about Bob Clark's facility in particular. There was, like, someone who worked there for four hours and then quit immediately just from Whoa. working conditions. Right, right, was- right. 
cool. And I'm not saying if you went in my room right now, there wouldn't be a turd somewhere or a forward fly or whatever. But I'm talking about like an animal that had died and then decayed and then it was stewing in like a paper towel maggot stew. So they took them that long to notice that it was dead. Yeah, it's uh, not fine. But if you're going to buy a baby boa, you don't necessarily want to buy it from that environment for lots of reasons. But one of them being there's absolutely no like QC on arena virus. And what I've noticed from testing from people is that most of the people who have boas that are like normal, cool breeders, even if they don't test, they're mostly negative because a lot of the positives have indeed died or they wouldn't have a boa breeding operation if they weren't all negative, right? Because they would have already died. because right, it would collapse. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that person already left the hobby. They're called me. They already left because they all died. But the ones that have like persisted and but didn't test... For the most part, their stuff is still good because they just got lucky. It's called getting lucky. Right. Yeah, luck of the draw. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. And so you could get lucky from a normal dude or dudette with a boa collection. But I still wouldn't recommend it because I was sent positives from normal dudes and dudettes too. It just wasn't 30%. It was more like 5%. If it's one sneaks in, it gets it spreads way too fast and you're like fuck you everything yeah. all your species also so you don't want to buy from wholesalers but you just so you do want to buy from breeders um who are willing to discuss and guarantee a money-back guarantee for positives on intake like yeah. that's something you need to talk about before you get the animal <sighs> home and before you test them and before you get a result back you should have already had a conversation before money exchange chance about what you do and what your expectations are and what result you would like if a positive happens. Right. A lot of these recent stories were people who just bought it and assumed everything was going to be good. The animal looked poor and or died and they tested it after the fact. So if they had gone to Bob Clark and be like, if I test it on intake and it's positive, can I send it back? He might have actually said yes. Like, who knows? You got to talk to him early and just assume any boa has arena until you know differently. In my opinion. And if someone tells you that arena virus isn't an issue anymore, what what should you do, Jessica? <laughs> I'd get that paper from 2021 that was just published <laughs> on arena virus and just send it to him. I'd be like, wow. And then and then discontinue all contact. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> I'm Run just away. surprised how many times I've heard it just in the last six months. Like, it doesn't exist or I don't. I haven't heard of anybody having a problem with it or something. And you're like, that's your criteria for whether or not it exists? Is this you didn't hear anyone with a problem with it? All all those stories are just misinformed people. Snakes only die from bad rats. (laughs) For Nido? I guess that or just any anything. Those are bad those are those are bad rats. They just got a batch of bad rats. That could happen to anybody. Bummer. I mean, bad rats can kill things, but like if it's got an infection we know could cause disease and then it dies under mysterious circumstances, I guess hypothetically it could also have been the bad rats. But is it not more likely that the infectious deadly disease that happens to be coursing through its body was what actually finally like kicked it over the edge and not mysterious bad rats? You can swab that dead snake and have the answer to all your questions. Uh, if it was a bad rat, it's not going to pop positive on a boy panel. No, it would just be a bad dead snake. And it yeah. would pop positive on like a salmonella test of its like gastrointestinal Correct. tract or whatever. Yes. That's it. I, it's the shortest arena virus discussion I could have uh, constructed. I cannot believe how short this has been. <laughs> it's very concise. I'm very proud. Well, there's a I'm fucking three hour Nido one. And I want people to go there yes. and just like substitute in their head the word Nido for arena. Because when we're like, why should you test? Or is it a mistake to call? Like all those are the same questions with the same kinds of answers. Like you should call because you're keeping everything safe. And it doesn't matter how many right. accidental ones, you know, exact same discussion. Just go listen to it. Episode seven is very good. Nobody listens to it. That's the same discussion. Feel free to skip the first hour. It's just (laughs) that's just chit chatting. But the second two hours very valuable. Yes. So this is the same thing. It's just arena virus is worse because it has vertical transmission, and boas tolerate it extremely well. 
Pythons, for the most part, tolerate it extremely poorly. But there's obviously variation all in between. That's it. That's your bows for Rain of Errors. Thank you. And Pythons. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. That is the number one secret to successful boa breeding. <laughs> yeah. Now you know. Yeah. My favorite is a there's a breeder who's famous for breeding boas for a long time. In interviews, he's like, I don't know if a renovirus exists or not. And I don't think mine have it, but I don't really care or test. I'm going to keep a secret who this person is. But I know people who have bought from him and tested. All of his stuff is negative. So the reason why he's doing good job it's because he just accidentally bought negative ones. Just got lucky, yeah. All along. And so like it's cool that he didn't doesn't feel like testing, but he's just lucky. It's just the survivorship bias that he bought yeah. snakes that weren't sick and he's closed his collection for twenty years. And they're still not sick. Because that's how infectious diseases work. It doesn't come out of fucking vapors or whatever. The miasma. No. It's cause it's caused by a virus. That's how you are successful at breeding boas. And all right, Jan, I guess what? We had a five star review that somehow I didn't pay attention to for a long Yay. time. <laughs> this person messaged me like two weeks ago and I was in my like request queue and I was like, fuck me. And I missed it. And I said I was sorry. But it was uh, Ellie's Exotics on Instagram. Ellie underscore Exotics. They are an up and coming breeder of ball pythons, milk snakes, axolotls, and retex, and maybe other stuff. I don't know. That was what was on their Instagram. Thank you for the five-star review. For anybody else, we will do a shout-out for a five-star review if you just send me a screenshot of the review. Maybe one or two per episode. That's it. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. Thumbs up. It was a nice one. Uh, yeah, we had a couple other people message and comment on the YouTube, and that's all been nice. So thank you for all the comments and the messages. I did make a Facebook account for the podcast and a Facebook group. So if anybody wants to join the Facebook group... Uh, we're going to start doing like after show, like topics, like, do you think Bob Clark's full of shit? And then people can just share their feelings about the podcast at, or whatever, right. you know? Yeah. Um, cause I think it'd be fun to hear people's feedback in a, cause I think a problem of, of us like soliciting messages is nobody wants to like get out in front of the conversation. You know what I mean? But if they could like mm -hmm. just post under another topic, they don't have to feel like right. they're being singled out or I think we'll get more feedback that way. That was the idea. And that group is private. So you have to request to get in, but uh, uh, whatever. I think for both mods, it's, it's not a hard question. I think the question is like, do you believe you can use PCR testing to discover disease in reptiles? And the answer is yes. And so that's all I have to say. <laughs> and then you get in. Good job. <laughs> There's that. It has a funny name. Did you like the name? I accepted being a mod. I would like a gold star for that, but I have no idea what the name is. Uh, I thought That's of bad. many names, but I don't know if that was a good one or not. It oh, yeah, okay. The hold back harem. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, we mostly oh, hold back oh, girls. No, it's We it's are crazy. girls. Obviously, boys are invited or boys or girls or any combination thereof or theys and thems. I don't care. We're an inclusive, fun place. I just like the word harem because I thought it was funny. I'm it sorry. It is funny. Did you hear that US Argo only has 7,000 members? I didn't until I read our notes for this episode. That is shockingly small. I know. It's crazy. It came up on one of the ball python groups. And I was like, I'm pretty sure this ball python group has 30,000 members. Yeah. Just this one. What are y'all doing? It's crazy. I don't know what it means. They just did an update on the, the Lacey Axe or the Compete Axe. Was there anything in it? I, saw, I read part of it and I was like, this doesn't look like anything new is happening. And then I moved on. No, no. It was just basically like, we need to get it rewritten because one passed one way and one passed the other. And we needed to be like fixed discrepancies between the two to get the Lacey part out. Right. I think so still the like Senate nothing. sent their version of it back like they just did the procedural technique to reconcile but they didn't actually make a reconciled version yet correct right so it should go our way but it's not done yet maybe i've seen some ballsy ass fucking moves from people where they're like i'm confident it won't pass at all ever 
and like, then it passes flying colors. <laughs> I know. Well, if it doesn't pass this time, it's going to pass eventually. And I'm surprised how boldly people have been like, it will never pass. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will get what they want eventually, which is at Correct. the very least the injurious species list not being able to cross state lines. Well, and them having control of the list is something they also want very badly. Right. So if you think that's Without never going to happen in the rest of your life, I think you're completely mistaken. It's just like, when? Puff, puff, give, man. Because <laughs> that's what's happening right now. <laughs> so unless you can convince them to take something off of the injurious species list, like red ticks, I don't know, or whatever you like that's on there, then that's the only way I could see destiny changing they will get the power to regulate interstate transfer injuries which is list eventually either this time or next year or the next year like frankly i don't think like fucking green anacondas are a threat to anything there's only like 10 in the hobby so do they really need to be on the injurious species list probably not what have you seen people talking like do they seem scared or do they seem bold no they don't seem scared they have survivorship bias like nothing's gonna hurt my hobby and i don't have to do anything to keep it safe yeah Less reach government. out you know, like <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going underground i'm gonna you're gonna take my gun or i'm gonna ignore it if it happens they can't tell me what i can keep in my own property <laughs> yeah and, I, and of course they can't tell you what to keep but where are you gonna put, send all those mainland retics you breed where do they send them anyway? That is a great To the feed no. mill. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we've to definitely the talked about this. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely talked about this on the Discord recently. Like, we probably need a whole food supplier for snakes, for snake eating snakes. So maybe we should just go ahead and just mentally commit this to memory that all those baby retics need to just go ahead and get signed up for the feeding to king cobra parade because we don't need that many and it's fine so what episode was that 19 calling snakes go listen to that one that one was good i just thought the number seemed atrociously low and i had less hope that we would succeed after knowing it was that low i know reach out reptiles started a youtube channel for us arc i don't know if you saw that i did not see that yeah he it's like, I'm going to stop making my own YouTube videos and just make one f- specifically for US Arc every week or whatever. And I was like, that's cool. But he has like the most to lose of anybody, maybe ever, if this particular version of it gets passed. And why is that? Because all he breeds are dwarf retics. Oh, okay. And he bought that new facility to like promote his dwarf retic thing. And if you can't have them cross state lines. I don't know how many dwarf retics you can sell in the state of Pennsylvania. Just saying. Not very many. <laughs> and he's a nice guy and he has nice snakes, but like he is one as a person who seems like extremely confident it will not pass. And I'm like, based on what evidence, just your financial incentive in the in it not passing is why you have that confidence? I don't know. Yeah. Cuz I've didn't even get a response from my senators. They don't give a fuck. No, none. <laughs> and the people who none I have Benito. seen get a response always get like the generic form letter right. after 5,000 emails. So of the 7,000 US ARC members, how many people messaged? 1,000? 1,500? And that's not enough in the whole country. Right. Nobody cares. We got changed. a fucking World War Three going on. There's no senator in the world who's even thinking about anything that we care about right now. Is either is going to accidentally be on it or accidentally be off. And it doesn't matter. Right. That. What a downer. All right, let's talk about something fun. Carbon and RDR Black Eyed Anary for like the second or third time were proven to be compatible again. Do you know what those are? Do you remember those? Nope. So Carbon is a... Let's go back. RDR Black Eyed Anary is Ralph Davis Reptiles Black Eyed Anary. It's a... Are these corn snake words? Oh, sorry. Boa words? Boa words. Okay, got it. Go. So there are two... T- <laughs> <laughs> so there's like... A billion kinds of anery and boas, and they were all fine. So that's why we didn't talk about it in the the shitty boa morphs episode, because they're all perfect in every way and beautiful. And I actually really like anerys because I have like a problem with gray snakes where I'm like really into it. She's really into gray snakes. She's like way too into it. And then (laughs) carbon is 
Boa Afflictions morph. Remember Boa Affliction? Mm-hmm. The the girl in the grass with the, mm-hmm. with the tights on. That that's uh-huh. Boa. Yeah, nope, I, it's burned into my memory <laughs> for all time. Okay, so girl in the grass guy found a black eyed annery looking type mutation in his Aztec stock, and he's like, "This is totally new. I'm gonna call it Carbon." And so he sells his for six five six times the amount of an rdr black hat annery visual because he was saying it was different and they're at the very least 100 percent allelic or not just exactly the same allelic <laughs> <laughs> and he's very defensive about the fact that they're the same his do look a little do bit look- nicer oh, but, okay but i think it's polygenics like his look just higher percent colombian and RDR black and anneries are out of whatever, like Nicaragua or whatever, so they're like darker and dirtier. But if you bred an RDR black hat anery to a Colombian and bred it back, you get some that look like carbons. So I think I, that's enough of a difference for me to be okay with him saying, because like candy and albino are enough of a difference that it's, I'm like, okay. you know. Yeah, but candy and albino are totally two different genes. These are the same genes, but with different polygenics affecting the appearance. It's, so you're saying it's like Desert Ghost and Enhancer. Yeah, but but even different, I think. Even more different. I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, there's not as much selective breeding. In, but it's, yes, there's it's like no that. There's selective breeding <laughs> in pythons. It's like having a, a candy cane corn and a reverse Oka tea. They're literally the exact same gene. It's just there's been selective breeding to make one red on a white base and one is red on an orange base with no black and it's just selective breeding 100 percent. and if you mix them together you get a mix and they're both homozygous for amel enhancer okay. like i still like think there could be potentially two alleles there maybe so they're selective i almost think it's more likely there's two alleles but you don't believe that with carbon no okay they look a hundred percent the same just with different locality percentages in them that make different colors but his are i'm talking like a regular rdr black eyed annery is three four hundred dollars and he's been selling his for multi thousands of dollars like does some selective breeding pressure make the difference make sense maybe not that much of, yeah i mean if it was like five hundred dollars more yeah it was like yeah. nice this is like orders of magnitude like four or five thousand dollars and it was supposed to be new it's funny because he gets real mad about it on his Instagram. <laughs> uh, he used to like my stuff a long time ago. And then I started talking about testing too much. And he stopped liking my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had any ovulations from your python, ball pythons? I believe I've had... I've missed every ovulation in ball python world this year. Is that crazy? I, but I believe I've had three. Because they're going to shed okay. now. Last time I ultrasound them, they were 30 plus. Right. And it's been two or three weeks, and then they shed, and you're like, I'm assuming you ovulated at some point during there, because why would right. you be shedding right now? But I think I've had three. How many have you had? Um, I have three clutches in the incubator, and I think I have eight girls that have had their pre lay shed. That's a lot. So that's like 11. Good job. But like I said, three are already, already laid. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm really surprised at how high the number is already for the season. It means you'll have a lot at the July show, potentially. Potentially, if everybody eats the May show, I will not have as many as I thought I would. Did you think you were going to have a lot of stuff going earlier and they're going later? Um, I thought that I would have some more going earlier because I had a bunch of girls that at the end of like in November, December that were high millimeter counts and then i had one pass away and then i had some that just like stalled out at like 30 and didn't ovulate until like february and i thought you know beginning of december if they're at like 30 33 they're gonna be ovulating in the next month then they didn't ovulate for like eight weeks why did they do that i don't know some like i've had one that went from zero to 25 and weeks between ultrasound so it had to have been like five weeks but she was literally like nothing she laid in September and it was like she should have just been like maybe like 10 and she said 25. 
don't even have any locks or anything. And I was like, oh, crap, I better put, put a mail in. I'm really confused now that I have the ultrasound more actively being used. I think next year I won't even fucking use it until January. I, was, I might not even pair anything until January. Just how late my room goes. I don't know. It's a waste of time. I think those like December locks are what make January follicles, but not the definitely not the October locks. Yeah, or those September. Like Even if yeah. they're going to lay in May, it seems like it doesn't matter. They're just like I'm good. I'll just plow, yeah, plow I, right when I want to plow. Right. I think I'll just feed the males up and let them keep resting. Yeah, I've been all over YouTube being like, when does this person lock? Versus what millimeter? Because I know what people have said where you like do an intro lock at 10 or 12 just to see if it makes stuff start. But 12 would be already starting. But I haven't seen that it matters. Yes. And then some people are like, you need to get one between 17 and 20 because that's probably the one that matters the most. And then maybe one more if you want. At 30. Yes. I don't know what matters anymore, though. It feels to me like only the one in the middle matters. Yeah, but I would never feel confident with just one lock. Right, but if they'd already had three locks, because they locked in October, November, oh, December. Oh, totally fine, for sure. Would you lock them again at 30 if you finally ultrasound them and they'd gone to 30? Probably not, right? I haven't been... I've, the ones that got big, I just, like, ignored them. I was like, you've locked three times earlier. It depends. If they haven't had a lock in three months yeah heck yeah i'm gonna throw a mail in there at 30 but and like they had their they first at lock like, at 20 or their first lock at 12 no, and then it like skipped a, let's say they had a lock in september and then they had a lock in december and in december they were still at like 10 millimeters and then all of a sudden they went from 10 to 30 i'm gonna throw a, a mail in there okay because it's I can been see since that. december yeah, I just they had a I'm lock. just trying to like refigure it out because I think what people It's going to take all season and it's going <laughs> to take I'm still next season I'm still going to be effing with it because uh... it, they're going to going to go if they're going to go. It, don't, it doesn't seem like locks motivate anything. Maybe. But maybe it is motivating the ones that are going. It's so hard to tell. It's so hard to tell. But like I said the one that had jumped to 25 who like I said shouldn't even be laying until September. She hadn't had any locks this season. So she, her last lock was... Last year? May of last year. So almost a year ago. And she was still like, all right, I'm ready. I'm thinking it should be something like, if you want to give them a first lock at whatever baseline is for them, which in some it seems to be five or six, and some their follicles seem to be like 10 at, as base. 10 or 12, yeah. Yeah. And so like... My mystic is always 10, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12. And I thought she was doing something, but she hasn't changed. So she hasn't chosen to do. So that's her baseline biggest right. sort of runners up. So locking her has never made her choose to do anything. But it seems to me like one lock has made other ones go from nothing to 10 or what or 20 or whatever. I still think a first lock is good. I just think almost one lock a season. And if they don't do anything with that maybe double check in four months or something, but it doesn't seem to change destiny that much for yeah. old ones or young ones. They the just ones seem that to are doing care. Nothing. I'm trying to get a lock every three months, but that might be wasting the mail. I will see next year what I do. I mean, I spoke too soon last week that none of my 2020s were doing anything. Cause I did. Cause have... aren't they now? Well, one of them is at 20. Yay. Hey, so... one is one. <laughs> I'll take it. None of my 2020s are doing anything. To me, it's clear and not that... even all of my 2019s are doing anything. Oh, yeah, me too. Fuck those 2019s. <laughs> the 2019s, it's like 50-50. And then she could still go on to reabsorb or whatever if she right. wants to. And then I have maybe five that have follicles that are noticeable size, but not greater than baseline. 15. I have a, quite a bit that are 15 and above. See, I would consider a 15 a snake that's doing something with those follicles. Right. Or, I mean, sometimes they get to 15 and then they just... Are those 2020s months. or are those... No, no, no. That's all of my snakes. Okay. I have none. No 2020s are above 10. So I have five 2020s with follicles that are... Like, they could do something with it and only one that's 20. Oh, okay. So you have, like, five that are, like, 12 plus. No. Like, 
10, 11, 12. So like they, it's, to me, it's still baseline, but I have some that have nothing like no, you, right, right. you can't you assume it's a else. male. <laughs> right. You, yes. you resex it. Cause you're like, holy hell, I can find nothing. Right. So that's out of 35, 20, 20 females. So to me, that number kind of makes sense. Five of them are sexually mature. One is deciding to do something about it. And the rest are actually not sexually mature yet. And so I don't know if other people get better numbers or whatever than that, but that's the numbers with a large sample size that I'm seeing. Yeah. My 2019, that's the fatty Kathy that I've had to put on a diet. She's still like, I can almost never find any follicles (laughs) to even look at. Is she, and she's never gone off food? No, she eats voraciously every week. Maybe that's what she needs. It's like go off food to like go through puberty. Maybe uh, she's 2,500 grams or something. She put on like a thousand grams in a year. She's a ridiculous. She's getting a small every other week now, mm-hmm. but she would take like probably like two mediums a week. If you let her like, she's that big of a pig. Uh, I guy, th- I feel like the ones that are off feed now are going through sexual maturity and are getting follicles. Once they go back on food, that's what it looks like is happening. I still have a ton of female ball pythons that are off food. They're young, like most of them. Yeah, I have like half a dozen 2020s that are at like the 1,000 gram wall. Right. And my 1,000 gram wall is like at 1,500 grams, 1,700 grams. Like they were big and that's cool. I mean, some of them were smaller, but they all just at the same time in the winter were like, Mm -hmm. just like the males. Even if the males were being bred, they all just went off food at the same time. So it's interesting. I was honestly surprised there was 20 millimeter follicles in that pie. It, It does like beg the question, like, is it worth feeding everybody a lot to find one 2020 that will maybe go? We I talked think, about this before yeah. and I, it does not. <laughs> right. I still think it's no, but I think it is worth like scanning anything that's of size just to see if it's doing something frisky. Cause she was locked in September and then not again. And then I scanned her when I scanned her two weeks ago and she had 20 by herself. So did you give her another lock at that yes, point? Yes. Right. Okay. I do wonder if like if she had gone the whole rest of the way, if she would have used stored sperm, which she could have technically, biologically. Right. But I did give her another lock just to be like, this is the one that's fertilizing things. You have a man. Do it. Don't reabsorb, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I saw your, your king snake slugged out. How'd that go? Did it hurt you in the heart? Is your male a bum male? That was my first thought. Um, he's a proven breeder. Okay. I didn't buy him because he was a proven breeder. I just, it was information that was given about him. But he is older. Um, he is older. Yeah. He's like 10. So it de- like very well could be that he is a bum male. I have to wait for her to shed again, right? Her post lay shed and then I can do another lock. And then if she's going to go again, yeah. that's when she'll go again. So well, I she'll try- lay like 60 days from when her babies would have. When her babies hatch is when she'll lay her next one, if she's going to do it. Oh, okay. So she ate really great, but she slugged out. And she only laid three eggs. So, I mean, it's possible that because I didn't feed her heavily before I put her down into brumation and I didn't do do a long enough brumation, that that could have had something to do with it. The other king snake female just shed. So she should be laying here in the next two weeks. And if she slugs it out too, I mean, that could be an indication that it's the male, but that could also mean I didn't feed her and I didn't do, you know. So See, I don't think it was the food at all. I don't want you to think that you messed that part up. It might have just been like the male wasn't down long enough, so he didn't have enough time to do, to make sperm, even though he doesn't technically need to be down. Or like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm not, it's not like discouraged. Obviously, I triggered an ovulation and there was eggs that resulted just because they weren't fertile like I'm not discouraged by that I'm a little bummed but I I'm like I at least did something right <laughs> you know what I mean like there were eggs produced yeah even if they're not fertile like I feel accomplished by that even though some people might look at it as a failure I'm like were you sure they weren't fertile because king snake corn snake eggs they're not they don't have a lot of veins in them they were really long and weird so that's a reason but they don't have like an obvious embryo and tons of veins when they're first laid like a ball python what do they so look I like i have them in a box are and they I'm rotting the other one to lay they are not rotting which is surprising i'm 95 percent sure they're slugs 
but they are in I put them in a in an egg box and I'm waiting for the other one to lay but I'm they're like really dark yellow so like I'm pretty sure because I've seen ball python slugs so they I'm pretty sure they're slugs I mean yellow is a good sign they're slugs I guess I want to reinforce for everybody at home the when colubrid eggs are born they haven't been like incubated internally in the mom for almost any amount of time like they are in ball pythons where they're like half grown when they're laid you're like here's a little embryo they almost look empty but there's just like a little bit of blood vessels and that's it and they cook outside and yours almost looked like three eggs were connected together to make one ginormous egg and then there was another set that's like three or four eggs connected together it was very strange yeah one of them was really oddly shaped yeah so they don't look like you'd expect them to look so I guess that they are in an egg box. They're just at room air in my snake room, and I'm waiting for the other one to lay. So it could be, but I'm pretty sure they're slugs. But either way, like I'd never done it before. <sighs> You're doing I don't great. Know, like did it? I it worked. So I know I'm not discouraged. Mm-hmm. I would give the same trio even if everybody slugs out. I would. I'm gonna try again next season. If okay. I don't get any babies this season with the same trio before, I would be like, oh, the male sperm doesn't work because I want to brumate them for longer and I want to make sure they're at a, a good weight and stuff. And so there's a few things that I would tweak that I think might help. And I think I'll do three locks next season. This season, I only did two. Yeah. So we'll Just see. don't get them too fat because like, I know you keep saying I don't feed any extra going down. I know some people do, but I do not. Because they're usually, it'll make them too fat when they come back up, and then they will not be able to pass their eggs, in my opinion. Okay, well. So I don't think that you fucked up by not feeding them extra to put them down. I don't know who even recommends that, bar check or something? Bar check has a very weird colubrid feeding protocol. Um, I'd have to, yeah, it was just in some of the articles that I read that they said that you wanted to fatten up up a little bit before brumation. But I didn't get them until right before I brumated them. So I didn't even feed them. All right. And they were only eating like once a month. Maybe, no, maybe twice a month, every two weeks. Right, but they didn't look people. fat to me. That would have been a normal body condition to go down and then get sort of fat in the spring. And then they lose a bunch of weight. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, I've... It's easy to overfeed a colubrid, like, because you think they need it. And then you're like, fuck, it's got hips. It's got hips. Watch out. Yeah. I mean, I think I did a good job not overfeeding them during the season, but getting them the food they needed. I don't know. It it was a really interesting experience, and I am glad I did it, and we'll see if it produces anything. If it doesn't, they're literally there to eat dead ball python babies, so it's not a huge deal if they don't produce, but it's been a fun brain stimulation exercise we'll see nice yeah i'm up to seven colubrid clutches at this point which i feel like is a lot that's rad didn't you only have two or three last season three so two corn snakes one japanese red snake right now i have seven and i have that's awesome five more to go or something it's been very crazy as always because Everybody's doing something different. I've already talked about this, but like the Slowinski, I, I thought she might've been egg bound, but she just wasn't ever happy with any of the egg boxes I gave her. So she laid eggs and then immediately shed because she had waited that long to lay her eggs. Her eggs look good still though. She just held on to them for like 20 days, just too long. So 20 extra after 14 days or 20 total? Like 20 total. Like a whole week longer than she should have. Right. Sometimes they lay as soon as five days after they shed if they're really warm. But usually it's around here with my ambience. It's like 10 to 11 days. But she was like 20 something. I feel like my king laid at 10. And I wasn't even sure she was going to because like I said, I couldn't feel eggs. But she only had three. So. Right. And I'd never, I'd never groped a king snake for eggs before. So. Next time. Yeah, I, I feel I feel okay that I that I missed three probably weird slugs. shaped eggs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, eggs are good eggs will like suck the life out of the snake. And so you'll start to see their spine and they get really skinny. And then you just like a string of pearls. Like it's super 
obvious to me when an egg is good and it's in a female that's doing her thing normally because she'll lose so much weight. Just literally count them. Yeah, hopefully your next girl does better. That's all. It'll be fun. Yeah, it was it was a good learning experience. Hopefully there's lots, lots more eggs this month. I have one that's on day like 40 and I'm like, I am not about that life. You guys need to lay on day 30. And I still need to meet up with more mechanics and check out the clutch that we shared. When's that going to happen? I have family in town this week and my kid had surgery last week. So this weekend or next weekend soon. Okay. Yeah, they were nice. You want to tell yeah. everybody the pairing who don't, doesn't follow you on Instagram? Yeah, my Desert Ghost pin male I loaned to Morph Mechanics, and he paired him to his pastel Inchi Calico female, and she had nine eggs, and they all hatched, and they're beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty excited about that. I There's some good combos. Well, there's one last thing. Square held one of my transactions as potentially fraudulent, and I don't think it was. So I emailed them all the information about the guy, including his driver's license and credit card that matched his name, and they did, did you not. ask for that prior to the transaction, or? Uh, no, I asked. They flagged it like immediately upon running it because they're like, "This is unusual for you." I was like, "Okay," so I gave them all that, and they're like, "We'll process it in two business days," and then they did not do it in two business days and i sat on customer service line for two or three years and they just wouldn't release the funds so like we'll get to it when we get to it and i'm like fuck you and so i refunded it and then use paypal dreaded paypal and so i'm shipping the snake out tomorrow after this incident so now i don't know what to do so if anybody wants to recommend a credit card processor this disheartening that is not square or paypal or cash app or venmo or Zelle, which apparently has a $250 limit for my bank. <laughs> That's all. I'm going to have to get like fucking like a QuickBooks invoicing system like Freedom Breeder has and just run credit cards that way. Like, I have no idea what to do anymore. Mm. Square works there until no it doesn't. <laughs> like if I needed their customer service to do their job and like approve the transaction, they're just like, we can't. We're not going to. We have to wait for the people who approve fraud transactions do it i'm like can you tell me when they're like nope so i'm supposed to like let his money be held in fucking purgatory and i don't ship the snake until you say random time they're like yep i'm also in india so i don't actually speak english that well like great so i don't know this is hard life's hard that's it that's my whole story it's supposed to be the answer it's not supposed to be (laughs) doing crap like that yeah i mean I mean, we talked about this before, but CD Exotics lost their account because they decided whatever her representative was looking at just looked at her account and been like, you sell snakes, fuck you. So I like intentionally avoided the word snake in any of my stuff. I'm like, the product is pastel inchy. And I said it was like a pet, but I never said what kind of pet. (laughs) And so they didn't like turn my account off, but they could have at any time because they'd been like, ugh, you're gross. So I don't know what's going on. It drove me crazy all like I had to like, you know, he paid me on a Friday and then I had to like think about it all weekend. And then they took their two business days and then I was supposed to ship on Tuesday and they're just like, nah. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I'll ship on Wednesday. Nah. And then I was on by Thursday. I was like, fuck you. And I refunded him his money and did through PayPal. <sighs> How are you supposed to sell snakes if you can't receive money for them? Jana? I don't know. How are you supposed to sell snakes when people like tell you they're going to buy your snake and tell you they're going to send funds and then they ghost you <laughs> after that you happened spent to you? a week talking to them yeah was, i took everything off of Mar- morph market oh like, did you I, jana I, gave I, up I had, everybody <laughs> i had like six snakes up there that i actually don't care if i sell that i can totally sell at the show that it's like i just put them up there so i had like inventory or whatever and uh, so much bs and i was just like you know what nope nope i'm good i'm good i'll just keep them and feed them it's that's not a big deal see how are we gonna sell snakes jana in the future well i like selling at shows a lot and i do well at shows so i'm happy with that and hopefully the higher end stuff will sell on work market and the lower end stuff that's just 
tedious like i don't know it's okay to have a tedious week-long conversation with somebody over you know a couple thousand dollar snake than it is you know a four hundred dollar snake that they're trying to like finance through paypal and like all kinds of bs you know what i mean wow yeah i mean a hundred percent i just like wonder if it's gonna be the same thing i mean i'm trying to sell a twenty five hundred dollar snake you know it's the same thing yeah what's the cheapest you'll take we'll see. and <laughs> what's your rock bottom price? what's your longest payment plan bitch i'm moving no <laughs> payment plan i know what's wrong with you i can't like half ship it out of the fucking back of the truck i'll throw it at you on my way east. do you have a move date no we're just oh, living okay. on the edge right now I'm fucking crazy living people. on the edge all right you're gonna tell me if you have a move date right it's got has to be sometime in the month of june or july that's my move date okay Besides that, I don't know. All right, we're Lock basically near suitcase. <laughs> sneak my thousand or she just my pops hundred up. snakes in. God, you have such a big season coming up. Are you scared? Let's be honest. Um, you have I... like forty snakes paired. Is that right or something? Maybe. Mm-hmm. And then yep. like twenty definitely going, and then another going, fifteen that could go, probably going. Better... No, so it's more, so I have 20 that are definitely going to go that are like 30 and above. And then I have like 10 more that are 15 and above. And then I have like the 10 2020s and some 2019s that are just kind of like, eh, probably not going to go. How many are you going to wholesale to Bob Clark? (laughs) All of them. No, just kidding. Um, So yeah, no, I, I expecting i did 12 clutches first season i'm expecting to double that minimally like so 25 no i'm not scared i'm excited i've got lots more rodents going and i'm hoping to add i have the rack already i'm hoping to add a third rack of rodents here soon and i'm excited i'm really excited it's it's gearing up to the good part of the season and i'm a little surprised because my numbers my first season were horrible horrible i mean just like if you listen to that episode jessica literally goes whoa that's bad (laughs) (laughs) it was like 50 percent of what i paired went and that's that's really bad i think it'll be more like 75 80 percent this season Mm -hmm. so that's thrilling no i'm excited i'm really excited i'm ready it's like 250 baby ball pythons yeah but they're not 250 fireflies you know what i mean like they're good stuff so okay i'm, just I'm curious excited. if you're ready all right janice ready everybody i'm ready i'm not ready Bring it on. i'm not ready well you're moving i so, know i'm an yeah, idiot that noise. also That's just yeah I have, I have 250 like potential colubrids just colubrids uh, you should just send him to bob clark oklahoma and let oh, your Chris. son do kindergarten here uh, <laughs> i'm a, i am dumb That's. 100 percent. all right i think we did it five star reviews get a shout out everybody else head over to facebook and join the harem bye everybody bye bye